Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So if you've been watching my last couple videos, you know today's video is a focused summoning build called the Scion of Cthulhu. And maybe you've got some guesses as to how this build will work because, I mean, you probably saw the title of the video, you know we're making a warlock. But if you didn't know any of those things, no problem. Just be aware that I did a video a little while ago where I looked at how to use summoning spells in an optimized way, but also in a table-friendly way. And I determined that the summoning spells from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, at least some of them, meet those requirements. If that sounds a little fishy to you, I go through the full analysis in the video I'm linking up in the top right corner. That's the video you definitely want to watch before you watch this one. Salt Marsh is a town of about 5,000 people known primarily for its fishing. One day, the fishing ship, the Mushroom Sloop, sailed out with a crew of seven, but never returned. A week later, it was discovered, sails tattered, floundering in the waters of the ocean, and only one of those seven crew members remained. They seemed to be in perfect health, but something must have happened that they never spoke of, and they were forever changed. Welcome to my Patreon ad. If you would be interested in supporting this channel, please find a link to my Patreon page in the video description. Patrons see these videos early and without YouTube ads. Additional perks, depending on your level of support, include an exclusive Discord community, a monthly video callout, and my eternal gratitude, which I will express in videos just like this. So thank you so much to Lightfoot, Glenn Wilson, Gusto Morph, Jay Good, Jared Huberger, John Hugdahl, Wu Carl Kong, Lila Corpsegrave, Mark D, Lone Pilgrim, Michael Michael, Moxie, Nemo, Notorious Thief, Reichenstahl, Ryan Wilmot, Shane and Todd Beyond, Taftash, Thunderlock, Clovier, Vo, and William Whittles. Thank you all so much for your support. Let's get started. So I want to start with a little bit of a preview of what you should expect from this summon build, and that is we're going to be focusing on this summon shadow spawn spell, which is one of the better summoning spells in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and I'm specifically going to be focusing on the despair form, and that has the secondary feature that if a creature starts its turn within five feet of our summon creature, it has a 20 foot movement speed penalty, and if we can reduce their speed even further, then we could potentially get them to zero movement. Now, how can we take advantage of that? Well, if nobody else is in melee range than our summoned creature, then the enemy basically has to attack our summoned creature. Then we have the challenge is, how are we going to keep our summoned creature alive? And so I've made some decisions here that I think are going to help keep our summoned creature alive and make it so that a lot of enemies are going to have no option but to attack our summoned creature. When they do, they won't get their full attacks, and therefore our summoned creature should be more survivable. And because we're using Warlock with this build, we have Eldritch Blast on top of that, which is going to give us repeatable, decent damage on top of the summons damage. So when this build does a lot of damage is as soon as that creature starts attacking twice. The issue with going Warlock is that eventually this summon is going to stop scaling because once our pack slots get to fifth level, there's no way for us to upcast this spell any further than that. So I'm going to be cutting this build off at level 13. It still does well at high levels because high level spellcasters do well. I'm just not sure I'd be concentrating on summoning anymore once we get to those high levels and we have higher spell level options. So what we're going to see compared to the other summoning builds I'm going to be presenting is we're going to get more damage earlier on, but it will stop scaling up and up and up once we get to that 13th level mark. From my introduction, it should be clear that our background is going to be Sailor, and it will give us skill proficiency in athletics and perception, and tool proficiencies in navigators, tools, and water vehicles. We will be using the variant human for our racial selection. I have made charisma and constitution my two ability score increases. I've picked up the intimidation skill proficiency, and we are going to grab the moderately armored feat. This is going to give us proficiency in medium armor and shields. I figure the best way we can protect concentration on this character, first and foremost, is to get hit as little as possible. And we will increase our dexterity score with his feet as well, so we're increasing our charisma, constitution, and dexterity. Our starting ability scores, we're putting 8 in strength, 
15 in Dexterity, that gets bumped to a 16. 14 in Constitution, which gets bumped to a 15. And you know Resilient Constitution is going to end up on this build, so that's why we're starting with a 15. Intelligence, we're dumping. Wisdom, we're going to have 10. And Charisma, we put in 15, which becomes a 16. So before we get going on uh, Warlock Level 1, I do want to talk a little bit about our level progression. I'm going to be primarily a Warlock, but I am going to dip Sorcerer later on. And if you're wondering why I'm not dipping Sorcerer at level 1, there's a couple reasons for it. The first reason is I wanted moderately armored at level 1, and if I take Sorcerer my first level, it doesn't give me armor proficiency, so I don't qualify for moderately armored. And then I'm not even sure what feat I'm taking with the Variant Human then. I'd have to take moderately armored at 4th level in Warlock, and that would be 5 levels later, and I'd also have to deal with the fact that my character is going to have a really lousy armor class until then. The second reason I don't want to dip Sorcerer first is because the way Warlocks work with multiclassing is we're not combining our levels with other spellcasters when we're working on our spell slot progression. So we have this problem that we're going to be focusing on a summoning spell that's a third level spell, and if I cast it with a fourth level slot, it's like twice as good. And if I take that level in Sorcerer first, I'm holding off that fourth level slot for another level. And I don't want to do that. I want to get it as soon as I can. But I do want the level of Sorcerer eventually, because if nothing else, I want the shield spell and I want a couple first level slots from which to cast it from. So that alone makes me kind of want to go Sorcerer for one level, but there's actually a couple other benefits as well. So we will go back and grab a level of Sorcerer later, but for 19 levels of this character, we would go Warlock. I've added the Deception and Religion skill proficiencies. Now the subclass I'm going to be using is the Fathomless Warlock. Conceptually, I think this is the perfect choice for us. And it also has some nice synergy with the Despair form. Now, Fathomless, generally, I, I think I ranked it 5th out of 9 Warlock subclasses when I analyzed their features. So it's not super powerful. It just so happens that some of their moderately powerful stuff happens to synergize with what we want to do here. So the expanded spell list for Fathomless is reasonably good. However, it's not fantastic for this build. Uh, one of the big problems is that the best spells on this list are Concentration. And if we are concentrating on a summon, then we can't concentrate on anything else. The one Concentration spell that is really good here that I'm going to take anyways is Bigby's Hand. And that's because the summons that I'm going to be using aren't flying. And if I'm attacking a flying enemy, Bigby's Hand is a great spell. Now, there are some blasts on this list, like Lightning Bolt, Cone of Cold, Thunder Wave, and I'll take Lightning Bolt because, you know, at level 5, it does some decent damage, and it's not using my concentration. But once I am up to the level where I'm selecting 5th level spells, I wouldn't take Cone of Cold, because Synaptic Static is already on the Warlock spell list, and I think it's just a better blast. Alright, so starting at first level, we get Tentacle of the Deeps. This allows us to use our bonus action to summon a 10 foot long tentacle at any point within 60 feet of us. It lasts for one minute, so basically you're going to have it for one combat. You can use it a number of times, equal to your proficiency bonus per long rest, so at low levels I wouldn't necessarily expect it for every combat, but at higher levels, probably. On each of your turns, you can use your bonus action, as well as the turn you summon it, it can make an attack to any creature within 10 feet of it, and if it hits, it does a D8 cold damage, and its speed is reduced by 10 feet. The damage is not high, so D8 is not good damage. But it does scale a bit when we get to 10th level to a 2D8, which is still not great damage. However, we're kind of leaning into the speed being reduced by 10 feet, so we're absolutely going to be using our bonus action for this. Gift of the Sea is okay. I, I mean, situationally, it's good. A swimming speed of 40 feet, if you're underwater, is going to be super handy to you. The water breathing isn't such a big deal, you can get that with the ritual anyways, but the swimming speed isn't easy to get. There are some races that get a swimming speed, but they don't get a 40 foot movement speed. So, the Gift of the Sea, in the right situation, is useful. I just wouldn't expect to be underwater a whole lot. So our spell list at first level is pretty small, but we'll go through it quickly. Like most Warlocks, this Warlock is going to be concentrating on Eldritch Blast. That is going to be our primary attack and what we usually do with our action. 
does a d10 damage at first level, which actually isn't all that much. However, we're doing the d10 plus potentially another d8 if we hit with our tentacle. So overall, our damage ends up being pretty close to the baseline, which is based on Eldritch Blast, except adding the Hex spell, which is a d6. So we're probably just a tiny bit over the baseline, but close enough to say we're meeting baseline. The big things about Eldritch Blast, of course, are number one, we can enhance it with our invocations. And if you don't enhance your Eldritch Blast with your invocations, then you're not playing an Eldritch Blast centered warlock. The second thing about Eldritch Blast is because of the way it scales, we can get multiple blasts at 5th level, 11th level, and 17th level. So the damage scaling for Eldritch Blast is actually really good. We'll pick up Minor Illusion. This is mainly just for utility and occasional use in combat for things like obscuring things. So if you put like a Minor Illusion in front of someone, it can block line of sight and that can have some use. Armor of Agathis is probably the best Warlock first level spell. Provides you some temporary hit points and the big thing about it is it scales really well with your level. As well, if you are hit by a creature with a melee attack, then they take an amount of damage equal to the original temporary hit points that this spell provided you. And I'm going to take Create or Destroy Water. This is largely just for, you know, thematics. This very much is the Cthulhu-based character. We have a connection to the ocean and the water, so we're going to have Create or Destroy Water. One thing that people don't always know about this spell is if you come up against magical fogs, like let's say somebody casts a cloud kill, you can use create or destroy water to destroy a 30 foot cube of it. Now because we've picked up moderately armored, what you want to do if you're allowed to is roll for your starting equipment, like roll for random gold, and then you want to buy scale mail and a shield. And eventually you want to get half plate. So at level one, we blast stuff with Eldritch Blast and we hit it with our tentacle. And that's our main strategy actually right until level five. Level five is when the summoning part of this build comes together. So that is the level we're going to jump to now. For our Eldritch Invocations, our initial ones will be Agonizing Blast and Lance of Lethargy. Uh, now normally I take Agonizing Blast and Repelling Blast, but given our strategy, pushing creatures isn't actually what we want to do. We want them to be right beside our summon creature so unless we need to push them beside our summon creature which i don't think we'll need to do then i don't think it really helps us lance of lethargy however is going to combine with the despair form and now we're reducing their speed by 30 feet and then if we hit with our tentacle now we're reducing their speed by 40 feet and i think that's just about as good as we're going to get so the pact that we're going to be taking is pact of the talisman i normally consider this to be okay however it's essential for this build to work properly. I'll be showing on a battle map how this is going to work. But with Pact of the Talisman, the most important thing you need to know is that your patron gives you an amulet and you can wear it yourself and get some benefits or you can hand it to another creature. And I'll just tell you right now, we will want our summoned creature to be wearing the talisman. It just so happens there's some invocations that just work really well that are talisman invocations for the strategy we're using with this character. And with our first ability score improvement, we'll just take it right off the bat. Resilient Constitution. So now our concentration is pretty safe. So with our two feats, what we've done is we've protected our concentration as well as given ourselves two of the three primary saving throw proficiencies. And in addition, we also made sure our armor class was pretty good. So we kind of took care of our defenses. This also increases our hit points because we do get a bonus to constitution with this. So that bumps our constitution from 15 to 16. We're adding the Mind Sliver cantrip. So this gives us a cantrip option if for some reason attack rolls are not what we want to do, or if we want to try to debuff somebody's saving throws. Uh, if somebody fails a saving throw against Mind Sliver, the next saving throw they make has a D4 penalty on it. We're going to add Counterspell because of course we'll add Counterspell. We are going to add Fear. Now Fear uses your concentration. So if we are summoning, we're not using Fear. However, I don't envision necessarily this character summoning 100% of the time. Like if we're going to fight some creature that we think is going to be resistant or immune to cold damage, maybe summoning isn't our best choice. Then some strong control spells are a good option, and fear is one of the best of them. When creatures happen to be lined up, then lightning bolt is a pretty good blast. I'd never do it against a single creature, I just don't think it delivers enough damage for that. But if you can get several creatures with it, then the damage is pretty good. And because it doesn't use concentration, it is something we could do while we're concentrating on summoning. 
Of course, we have to take Summon Shadow Spawn if we're going to be concentrating on that. Now, I talked about the forms already earlier in this video, uh, so just know we're taking it as soon as it's available, and it is probably the spell we're going to be casting most of the time with our pack slots. And the third Eldritch Invocation we're going to take is Rebuke of the Talisman. Now, this is perfect for us, so read this. When the wearer of your talisman is hit by an attacker you can see within 30 feet of you, you can use your reaction to deal psychic damage equal to your proficiency bonus and push it up to 10 feet away from the talisman's wearer. So if our summon is wearing our talisman and it gets hit with a melee attack by a creature that ideally has a zero foot movement speed, then we can use our reaction and push it 10 feet away, potentially leaving it out of reach of anybody with all the rest of its attacks. I just want to quickly look at our damage at level 5. This is not nearly as good as it's going to get, but at level 5, we're going to have a 55% chance to hit with our Eldritch Blast. That's because we didn't increase our Charisma at level 4. Instead, we were worrying about our defense. So 55% chance to hit times 8.5 average damage with an Eldritch Blast times 2 Blasts. That's 9.35. Then we have a 55% chance to hit with our Tentacle. That does 4.5 damage if it hits. So that's 2.48. Then we have a 55% chance to hit with our summon creature. It only attacks once, does decent damage if it hits, 13.5. So that ends up averaging out to 7.43. Then 5% times 22, this is just working out extra damage from critical hits, does another 1.1. Gives us a total damage at this level of 20.36. That is 15% over my baseline of 17.7. But I do want to show you just exactly what happens with two more levels because this number goes up a lot. But before we go to those higher levels, let's talk about the strategy, because the strategy works right at level 5. Uh, so we're delivering decent damage, not fantastic damage, but our control is really nice. So on our turn, uh, I've picked an Adiug or a Toyug, I've heard it pronounced both ways, as our enemy. This is kind of the perfect kind of enemy for this strategy. And what we'll do is we are going to move up to it and we're going to hit it with our Eldritch Blast, ideally. And then we are going to hit it with our Tentacle, ideally. Now, of three attacks total, two Eldritch Blasts and one Tentacle, only one of them needs to hit for our strategy to work. So that would give this creature a 10-foot movement speed penalty. Then our Summon Shadow Spawn is going to move up to it, make more attacks. So we deliver that damage that I just showed. And we are going to end our turn right there. We want to be within 30 feet of our summon creature at all times, by the way. And then the Atoyug is going to get its turn. And it will use multi-attack. So it makes three attacks, one with its bite, two with its tentacles. Now, what this creature really wants to do is hit with the tentacle. Because if it hits with the tentacle, then the summon shadow spawn becomes restrained. And then the rest of the attacks it can make are made with advantage. So we'll say it attacks with the tentacle and it rolls well, and it happens to hit. So the tentacle is hit, now our summon shadow spawn is restrained, and on average it's taking 7 points of bludgeoning damage plus 4 points of piercing damage, or 11. So his hit points have been reduced almost by a third, and that is when we use our reaction, and we're going to use the Rebuke of the Talisman. So the toy takes another 3 points of damage, so we're actually delivering more damage than I just presented, and that Rebuke of the Talisman isn't limited in uses, by the way. And now the Atoyu has nothing it can do. There's no creatures next to it and has a movement speed of zero because it started its turn next to the Shadow Spawn. So it's not next to the Shadow Spawn anymore. So now it's kind of stuck and it's out of reach of anything. And we can just deliver more damage to it. On our next turn, the Shadow Spawn will move back up to it. It probably will take another 11 points of damage or so. And then we can do the same thing again. And this Audiog is basically fighting at one-third of its offensive capabilities, and it has no choice on who to attack. So we are delivering damage, but we're also delivering excellent control right at level 5. Now, full transparency, this is kind of the perfect kind of creature for this strategy. If we are fighting a creature that maybe has a fantastic movement speed, maybe it can take a minus 30 or 40-foot movement speed penalty and still get to where it wants to go. Maybe if this is a spellcaster, they don't care about being next to the shadow spawn. They're just going to cast their spells. But if it is a melee creature, then it kind of has to attack the shadow spawn. But even if this creature did have ranged attacks, usually the way multi-attack is worded, they either can make their melee attacks or their ranged attacks. 
and they're going to want to use their melee attacks because they would have disadvantage on ranged attacks while they're next to the shadow spawn. But once they make that first melee attack and we push them away, then they're stuck. They're basically losing out on their attacks. So we're going to look at 7th level and we'll go over how the damage changes with just those two levels. So first off, we're going to get an additional invocation and we're going to take protection of the talisman. This allows the wearer of the talisman to add a d4 to a failed saving throw. And boosting the saving throw of your summon creature is very useful. They will make saving throws. I've been playing summoners lately. They make a lot of saving throws. And a d4 is super helpful. And frankly, if you've got a cleric blessing you or something, that is super helpful too. I mean, I played just last night a summoner. Uh, now it was technically my previous build, but we had a case where one of the characters cast bless and was going to bless my character. I said, don't bless me, bless my summon creature. And that was the right move. At sixth level, we get oceanic soul. This gives us two features. First, we get resistance to cold damage. And in addition, when we're fully submerged, any creature that's also fully submerged can understand your speech and you can understand theirs. Now, a permanent tongue spell would be fantastic. However, this is obviously situational because it only works if you're underwater. The second thing we get is Guardian Coil. This gives us another use of our reaction. Now, remember, Rebuke of the Talisman uses our reaction. So we can do that or we can do this. Now, our summon creature is going to be near our tentacle, so we'll be able to use this if a creature is making like a single attack or only hits our summon creature once, then this will probably be better than Rebuke of the Talisman. We'll reduce that damage. But if it has multiple attacks and it still has attacks left, then we probably want to use Rebuke of the Talisman instead. I picked up Control Water and Dimension Door for fourth level spells. We're not going to be casting either of these spells, unless they're absolutely necessary. Uh, having situational spells like Control Water are just fine because 90% of our slots are probably going to be used on Summon Shadow Spawn. So we just won't have the slots most of the time to cast Control Water or Dimension Door. However, Dimension Door is one of those spells you want to have on your list because it doesn't matter if you want to summon again. If you need a Dimension Door, then you will use your spell on Dimension Door instead. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over these spells, but Control Water, I thought, thematically was really appropriate for us. Dimension Door, I just always take it. Now, level 7 is a great level for damage for us. In fact, it's going to be our best comparison to the baseline. So you can see here we've got a 55% chance to hit with two Eldritch Blasts, each doing an average of 8.5 damage. That's 12.6. Then 55% chance to hit but for our tentacle, which does an average 4.5 damage when it hits, so that's 2.48. Then we have our summoned creature. It has a 55% chance to hit for 14.5 damage per hit times two attacks, so that's 15.95. That's a big number. And then we have 5% chance by all the critical hit possibilities. That's another 1.43. We add those all together. That's a DPR of 32.46. Our baseline at this level is 17.7. This is 83% over the baseline at level 7. Just a really nice level for us. So this is the right point for us to multi-class because our creature is now attacking twice. It's never going to attack more than twice. So we don't have that kind of debilitating effect of slowing down our spell slot progression. So this is a good point for us to dip Sorcerer. And there's two reasons we want to do this. The first is Favored of the Gods. That will give us a saving throw boost when we need it. And the second reason we want to do it is so we can get the shield spell. And we'll have a couple spell slots to cast it with. First level slots. Because you never want to use your higher level pack slots on the shield spell. So we're getting those two things from Sorcerer. If you want all the details, the character link is in the video description. But Divine Soul Sorcerer Dip, mainly a defensive boost for us. Then with our next level, we're going to go back to Warlock, get our ability score improvement for 8th level. That's going to give us our 18 charisma. We're still going to want to bring that up again, which we can do at 12th level in Warlock. So we will continue with Warlock, and at 10th level, we'll get Grasping Tentacles. This gives us the Evers Black Tentacles spell, which is a good spell. And we can cast it once per long rest for free, and that's nice too. So it's basically additional 4th level spell for us. And when we cast it... By the way, we don't have to worry about our concentration if we take damage. Though, honestly, 
when you're this level and you've got this build, we're probably not losing our concentration from damage. If we lose our concentration, we probably got incapacitated or knocked unconscious. So we would still lose concentration on Eaver's Black Tentacles in those cases anyways. Now our tentacle also scales at 10th level, so it's going to now do 2d8 damage. Also, if we use Guardian Coil, it is going to reduce the damage by 2d8. At 11th level in Warlock, we get our Mystic Arcanum, so we can select a 6th level spell. Now if we wanted to do summoning, we could take Summon Fiend. Uh, that doesn't really work with our strategy though, so I'm recommending Mass Suggestion. It doesn't use Concentration, and therefore it still works with our strategy. When we get to 12th level in Warlock, we get an Ability Score Improvement, and we'll get our Charisma up to 20. We get two more invocations. First, we'll take Devil's Sight. This gives us the ability to see in darkness up to 120 feet, whether it's magical or non-magical, and Bond of the Talisman. So this allows us, when our summon is wearing our talisman, it can use its action to teleport to us, or we could use our action to teleport to it. This is limited in use. It can only be used a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus per long rest. We're going to get three more pack spells, and I'm selecting Bigby's Hand, Synaptic Static, and Teleportation Circle. I mentioned Bigby's Hand earlier in the video, but basically, if we're fighting flying creatures, our strategy doesn't work, because our creature doesn't fly. So that's when Bigby's Hand works really well. It's good against flying creatures. Synaptic Static does work with our strategy and works well with it. So as our pack slots, we get more castings of them, then we can do more non-summoning castings. And Synaptic Static could be a good one because it doesn't use your concentration, does good area of effect damage, targets a weak saving throw, and if they fail that saving throw, then they have a minus D6 on their to hit rolls, which actually helps protect their summon. Teleportation Circle, that one is just super circumstantial, but you know what? I think super circumstantial spells are just fine on higher level Warlocks. Now, when we are 13th level, we're still casting our Summon Shadow Spawn with only a 5th level spell slot. So, how does that affect our damage? Well, if we look here at our 13th level, we've got 60% chance to hit times 10.5. This is for Eldritch Blast, by the way. We get 3 Eldritch Blasts at this level. And that gives us about 18.9 points of damage. Then we have our Tentacle, which now does 2d8 damage. So, it's 60% chance to hit times 9 is 5.4 damage. Then we have our Summon Shadow Spawn. It has a 60% chance to hit now. When we cast it with a 5th level slot, it's doing 14.5 average damage per attack. And then 2 attacks, that's another 17.4. Then we're going to do the criticals. So basically everything that doubles on a critical I've added here, multiplied by 5%, gives us 1.93. Our DPR at level 13 is 43.63. The baseline at this level is just over 27, so we're 61% over baseline. So we've actually kept our damage pretty good. And the reason for this is because although our summon is less of our total damage than it used to be, Eldritch Blast scales nicely, the summon is still doing decent damage, and you add those together and we get well above baseline. Now, if you were to take this character beyond level 13, it would still be an effective character because high-level Warlocks are really powerful. So you're still going to be a powerful character right to level 20. But in terms of focused on summoning, nothing is really adding to our strategy anymore. The summon isn't getting any better. I don't know if I'd bother concentrating on it compared to other options at higher levels. So... Yeah, I, I think this is a good point for us to cut off this particular build, but if you do want to carry it past level 13, it will still do well. I am going to just kind of quickly give you some insight. If you did want to carry this build beyond 13th level, what would you do? So with my 7th level Mystic Arcanum, I would almost certainly take Force Cage. It's non-concentration. It's very powerful. With my 8th level Mystic Arcanum, I would likely take Demiplane. Demiplane can be a useful combat spell, but it's mainly a utility spell, and it's a very good one. For my 9th level spell, I would probably take True Polymorph. I think it's the best of the 9th level spells on the Warlock spell list. Though, if you do want to take Foresight or Blade of Disaster, those are still good spells, worthy of a 9th level slot. With additional ability score increases, I would probably expend them on feats. I think I would take the Alert feat for sure, and I might pick up the Lucky feat. Alright, so I'm going to wrap up this video here, but I want to just kind of 
tell you some learnings I had. Uh, so first off, the attempt to make it so that a creature can't move, I've done lots of builds that do that. They might use the web spell. I mean, this character might use Eber's Black Tentacles. The issue with those kinds of strategies, though, is some creatures are immune to being restrained, and a lot of creatures might make their saving throw. And those are both things you have to deal with with those strategies, but not this one. Another thing I've done on this channel is I've done grapple builds, and they attempt to get a creature speed to zero. However, some creatures are immune to being grappled. Others might be too big to grapple, and those can be issues for that kind of build. Again, we don't really have those issues here. We don't care what their size is, and we don't care if they're immune to being grappled. If they have a movement speed, we can lower that movement speed. That doesn't mean that everything's perfect here. Our shadow spawn does not fly, so dealing with flying enemies, this doesn't really work. Another thing is some creatures have a bonus action teleport, and if they do, they can defeat this strategy. Now they'll still take the damage, but they can defeat the strategy at least. But other than that, this is not an easy strategy to defeat. Now I did some damage calculations for what if we continued summoning and we went up in levels, and it stays pretty close. I mean, it stays above 50%, but it never gets super, super high. So if you wanted to continue with that strategy, you could. But I do think that the fact that those creatures' hit points are not scaling anymore could be a problem at higher levels. So if you like this build, please let me know in the comments down below. I love to hear compliments because it makes me feel good. But if you don't like this build, I would like to know that as well. And I would like to know why and your thoughts on it. And I might learn something from you. Either way, this is the end of the build. So until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon.